great pleasure for me to be able to introduce one of my classmates. Phil Lundbus and I were classmates at the University of Notre Dame, where we both got started in mosquitoes working together, the same bench or in the same place together. Uh, many years ago, I think it was back in the Mayo school somewhere. Um, after uh, uh, Notre Dame, he went on to get a PhD at Harvard. And one of those stories I'll tell is after Harvard, uh, for his postdoc, he went off to Kenya. Uh, at that time, there was a mosquito lab in Mombasa, run by Isopi, Nairobi. And I have to say, I, I went over and visited him at one point to collect uh, mosquitoes there. And I think it was the most, uh, what should I say, luxurious postdoc I've ever seen anybody. <laughs> Phil had, a, it was, he had an NIH fellowship, which at that time was paying, I think, something like ten or $12,000 a year. And uh, first of all, the lab in, in Mombasa was great. It was, it was an old mansion kind of place. And, Actually, from the place where you would sit and uh, sort your mosquitoes when you came in, the window sitting there, you could look out, overlook the Indian Ocean. You got tired of looking down the microscope. And Phil had a house right on the Indian Ocean. The beach was right back there. And I think, if I recall, he had uh, three helpers. He had a gardener, a housekeeper, and I think a foot. <laughs> Did you have a driver? I don't remember if you had a driver. I think he had at least three people. And this was all on an NIH fellowship, okay? And then when the lab got in trouble financially, he was using his leftover money to help support the research. So it was, it was quite a nice postdoc there. I, I had the pleasure of visiting him. Anyway, since then, he's come back to the U.S. I think you spent all your time back here in Florida, right, since you came back from, from your postdoc. And he's been down in Vero Beach in the, in the medical entomology lab in Vero Beach for, for not quite as many years as I've been here. Anyway, he's come up here to talk to us about uh, ecology and evolution of, of mosquitoes. He's probably one of the leading experts, I would say, in 80s ecology. Maybe not so much as Opry, but we'll give you 80s at least. And so he's going to tell us about uh, what he's been doing recently there. Thanks. And again, just turn off his left door a little bit. We'll get you the power pack. Thanks, Jeff, for that romantic uh, introduction and reminiscences. I didn't really have three employees working at my, my house. No, I, you, you embellished that a little, little too much, Jeff. But I also want to thank um, both Jeff and Maria Ducuasa for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to, in the first two-thirds of this presentation, discuss some of our work on understanding competitive displacement mechanisms between these two species of vectors, Aedes aegypti on the left and Aedes albopictus on the right, primarily based on our surveillance and experiments in Florida, and the last third discuss a field study in a dengue endemic region relevant to testing whether the competition that we observe between these species in nature uh, actually affects uh, dengue transmission in um, Rio de Janeiro. Are these general lights? Okay, okay. So it's important uh, just to begin to recognize that both these species are invasive throughout much of their distribution and that the mechanisms that led to the arrival and eventual establishment of these species were similar, just simply different vehicles uh, appropriate to different times of the transport of these species. Aedes aegypti having arrived at most of its destinations outside of Africa through probably through sailing ships, including those of the uh, slave trade to the Americas, and Aedes albopictus being transported much more recently, pro mainly by these big container ships. So uh, these invasion routes of Aedes aegypti are based on <coughs> research done here at Yale, um, in Jeff's lab, 
by his postdoc at the time, Walter Tabachnik, who by coincidence happens to be my boss at the moment. So you can see how uh, interrelated we are uh, as medical entomologists. And although Jeff has refined this out of Africa design through more recent research, the basic tenant of Aedes aegypti having evolved within Africa to a domestic form from a feral sylvan uh, precursor, I think remains uh, the accepted convention. And the uh, diaspora of this species, both to the west and the east, occurred differently at different times, uh, the new world being occupied earlier than the old world rather the Asian uh, subcontinent. The different uh, colors are meant to represent different genotypes of the species uh, based on isozyme electrophoresis done by Tabachnik and Powell. The range expansion of Aedes albopictus, as I said, primarily occurred much more recently, its native range being uh, in Asia and it having a, a much more temperate distribution than Aedes aegypti, owing to the fact that there is a, a diapausing stage in this species, but not in Aedes aegypti, which enabled it, unlike many of the other congeners, relatives of Aedes albopictus, to suffer temperate winters. And you can see that both South America and North America were colonized by different um, arrivals from different locations, but approximately at the same time. And what's also important for the context of our discussion of biotic interactions between these two species is that because these mosquitoes are both members of the subgenus Stegomyia, they have common behavioral and ecological um, activities that are contribute to their encounters, both as larvae in container habitats, the precursors of both of these that are, occupy artificial containers such as discarded tires, probably evolved in sylvan habitats in tree holes. And both species mate during daylight hours associated with host seeking, such as uh, this human and this um, colored pencil drawing and the, swar at the mating occurs associated with um, swarming around the host. So there are two points of contact where the, both uh, the adults and the immatures may, may meet. This map of the southeast of the United States shows the range of Aedes aegypti in the vertical lines in the brown distribution prior to the arrival of Aedes albopictus in Houston. Aedes albopictus uh, swept rapidly through the range of the Aedes aegypti, and within eight years after its first detection in Houston, the range of Aedes aegypti was reduced to the area circumscribed by the yellow lines, with the exceptions of a few large cities, such as New Orleans and Houston, where in the inner city, the colonization of aegypti was not affected by Aedes albopictus. These times underneath some of the cities where Aedes aegypti was wiped out indicates um, the approximate time, given the amount of surveillance done in those locations, that it was observed from uh, the presence of Aedes aegypti to the absence. So in the case of Lake Charles, within nine months, the Aedes aegypti was wiped out by Aedes albopictus. And this um, produced uh, a great mystery. The late doyen of uh, mosquito biology, who uh, was the leader, as Jeff uh, mentioned earlier, this is the leader of the lab that we both worked at as undergraduates. Uh, other individuals in this audience, such as Leonard Munsterman and Derlin Fish, also spent uh, formative stages of their career. He was known for a bit of hyperbole, but uh, in spite of that, this uh, it is what he uttered here in 1993 publication. It was basically true. A lot of people were scratching their heads about the, the mechanism 
And fortunately, uh, although I was working on other mosquitoes at the time this uh, happened, uh, it caught my attention and one of my colleagues at the Florida Medical Entomology Lab at the time was doing very valuable surveillance. These uh, graphics come from my uh, recently retired colleague, George O'Meara, showing the uh, occupancy over time of all the counties of Florida from north to south of the state by Aedes albopictus. And during that period, he also uh, conducted a transect down this um, highway that cuts through peninsular Florida, showing how the tires that he was investigating for um, presence or absence of these different species, uh, uh, Egypti and albopictus, gradually changed over this period of time to being uh, Egypti occupied to predominantly uh, Albopictus occupied. In fact, by 1994, only two cities still had any evidence of Aedes aegypti. Another, this is my colleague George O'Meara, another very useful um, habitat where we actually not, conducted not only surveillance but was uh, cemeteries because these container mosquitoes occupy uh, and grow and develop and emerge in the vases that are kept in most cemeteries for uh, bereavement and, and placing flowers. And it, was, it turned out to be a wonderful um, grounds for, for experimentation. But before I, um, the leading hypothesis for understanding the mechanism well, for about 10 years was uh, the superior larval competition of Aedes albopictus under natural conditions. And uh, both I and Steve Giuliano, with whom I, I shared uh, a lot of research collaborations, uh, conducted experiments not only uh, in South Florida, but in Rio de Janeiro, where we had an association with the uh, colleagues at the Oswaldo Cruz Institute. And I'm only going to summarize uh, these experiments in which we manipulated in uh, semi-natural conditions, larval densities, the autochthonous uh, organic matter, usually fallen leaves that represent the resource base for these larval mosquitoes and species uh, in container habitats. And the outcome from both uh, experiments in Vero Beach and uh, in Rio de Janeiro was remarkably similar. And the y-axis here is a, a consolidated, a, an amalgamated performance index, a, an analog of the finite rate of increase, which incorporates survivorship, uh, developmental time, and an index of, of fecundity. And you can see that under condition, Florida, well, Florida conditions and Brazil conditions with different genotypes, Aedes albopictus always has a lambda prime above the threshold necessary for um, positive growth. But under many conditions, particularly when the competitive conditions are higher or the um, amount of leaf litter is, is less, Aedes aegypti fails to meet uh, those, uh, uh, that, that threshold for, for positive growth. So that was the basis for quite some time. Uh, but I'm going to come in a few slides to a change of direction. But before I do that, because I wanted to present some other information relative to our studies that I thought would be more appropriate to an audience in a climate and energy uh, institute. These are three records from cemeteries uh, which show three uh, over 20, uh, yeah, 22 years of surveillance which show three cemetery types in relation to the presence or absence of Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. The top is a cemetery in Little Havana of Miami where uh, Aedes aegypti withstood a uh, brief establishment of Aedes albopictus in the mid-1960s and has persisted without uh, competition apparently from albopictus uh, since that time. The next two types of cemeteries are more prevalent in peninsular Florida. The uh, middle panel showing how the relative abundance of the two species changed after the establishment of Aedes albopictus. Uh, but th 
the two species have coexisted for the 21 or 22 years of observation. And the third type is equally common. Cemeteries where Aedes albopictus arrived, uh, and Aedes albopictus went extinct and was not observed again for the next 18 to 20 years. Now those sorts of experiments that I showed that were done in tires in Vero Beach and in um, cups in uh, the Botanical Garden at the Oswaldo Cruz Institute were also done in these cemeteries. And we could find no difference in the outcome of competition in the larval stages b between the, the coexistence cemeteries and the exclusion cemetery. So that particular paradigm, the effects of larval competition, could not uh, explain the difference between whether Egypti persisted or, or went extinct. So we were interested in investigating the aerial environment of these cemeteries because not only do adult mosquitoes have to persist, but so too do the eggs, which um, the 18 mosquito is rather unusual in that eggs are frequently laid, uh, pr primarily laid, above waterline and await flooding for, for hatching of the embryo. So we allowed um, colony mosquitoes, colonized from the cemeteries, uh, to oviposit on these tongue depressors, which were then set in six cemeteries, three of the extinction type and three of the coexistence type, to measure um, their survivorship in the same, um, you can buy these plastic cemetery vases uh, in huge numbers, so they were readily available to uh, use, and the depressors were suspended in those vases. Uh, a hole was cut in the bottom so that they would not flood and hatch the eggs. And then at um, two and four week intervals, we brought the tongue depressors back to examine relative survivorship uh, of the eggs of the, of the two species in the context of the different cemetery types. We also were able to acquire uh, microclimate information with miniature electronic recorders in the vases. The outcome of superior survivorship of Aedes aegypti eggs compared to Aedes albopictus, which was consistent across years of differential survivorship, was not particularly ex surprising. Unfortunately, because of the low power of the experiment, we weren't able to observe any significant difference between cemetery type, exclusion versus extinction, relative to um, egg survivorship. However, the microclimate information was still uh, relatively revealing when we put all the temperature and humidity um, observations from the different cemeteries. There were four vases in each cemetery that had um, microclimate recorders. We saw that the cemeteries in which Aedes aegypti persists were those with the highest uh, maximum and mean temperatures and the lowest uh, relative humidity. But as I indicated, we now believe that although larval competition is probably important in explaining distribution and abundance patterns to some extent, our emphasis has shifted to um, reproductive interference between these species and uh, another anthropogenic habitat that uh, we use as uh, field sites or salvage yards. And in these salvage yards, it's very easy to collect uh, large numbers of, in the rainy season, adult mosquitoes with power aspirators or BG sentinel traps. And although interspecific mating had been brought up as a potential interference mechanism to explain competitive displacement, most of the um, experiments, lab experiments done, were unconvincing to support the probability that this was an important mechanism. But I was challenged by a colleague, Frederick Trepe, who is now at Keele University um, in Great Britain, to use his technique of applying PCR diagnostics 
to the sperm dissected from sperm and theci of wild caught females to search for evidence of interspecific mating. And using uh, collections from two uh, salvage yards that we sent to Frederick in Kiel, we found that five out of 304 individuals had mated with the wrong species, and the uh, interspecific mating was bidirectional. That is, there were 80 Zalbopictus males mating with Egypti females, and vice versa. And I should caution that although, although these species are distantly related, there are no offspring from these uh, interspecific mating. And by itself, this very low percent, uh, less than um, 2 percent, would not seem necessarily that of, of significant impact, particularly to explain this huge sweep uh, that Aedes albopictus uh, affected on Aedes aegypti. However, we, uh, there was more to the story. We, Frederick and I felt that um, there might, from other evidence, be something going on related to um, the male accessory gland products that are transferred during mating and, and normal intraspecific mating. So uh, the great George Craig, whose picture you saw some slides earlier, probably his most famous contribution to mosquito biology was identification, if not the substance, but the fact that male accessory gland materials at mating uh, made females refractory to further mating. So we performed an experiment in Vero Beach, uh, actually using methods very much like George Craig did um, de many decades earlier, extracting accessory gland products from both um, male and female, male uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, um, homogenizing it and uh, injecting them into virgin females, both um, heterospecific and conspecific, and after the Females recovered from uh, these injections, uh, subjected them to um, mating opportunities from conspecifics. And indeed, the outcome of these trials was very dramatic. So you can see from the, the blue bar that extract from male Aedes aegypti did not affect Aedes albopictus in future insemination with um, conspecific males, but Aedes albopictus accessory gland product sterilized Aedes aegypti females. And so we felt that uh, this information coupled with the fact that these mosquitoes uh, were mating in nature still, even 20 years after the arrival of Aedes albopictus in South Florida, supported a uh, model that was um, referred to as satirization by the polymath Jose Ribeiro, known to many of the mosquito workers in this audience. He's better known as um, Dr. Spit, but I think that uh, owing to this, for his work on insect saliva, but um, maybe Mr. Sater also ought to be uh, now added to his uh, nom de plume. The, this, this is a little bit of an arcane graph, but it shows in the context of Lotka Volterra or resource competition, just a small incidence of satirization as low as one to three percent can lead to um, interactions that cause extinction of one species or the other. Coexistence is indicated in these squares that are white, but extinction in all other squares by the, by the black and the, and the magenta. So if these two species uh, are continuing to be sympatric, as they are throughout much of um, the south of Florida, the area that I um, indicated in one of the earlier graphs, one would anticipate that there should be rapid evolution of reproductive isolation for them to uh, minimize the type of interspecific encounters that effectively sterilize um, Aedes aegypti females. So we did um, cage experiments with 
Allopatric and sympatric isolates of Aedes aegypti, which are quite easy to come by in Florida, and in no small part because the Florida Keys, such as Key West, uh, has kept Aedes albopictus out, and as a consequence, Aedes aegypti in that context is allopatric. And our hypothesis was. Um, substantiated by these experiments, that is to say, female, in cage experiments, female Aedes aegypti exposed uh, from an allopatric source, such as Key West or the Little Havana Cemetery in, in Miami, were more susceptible to interspecific mating or, or satirization than their sympatric counterparts. And although the converse cross occurs in cages, you can see that it occurs much less Frequently, and by the way, this, these experiments are are not done with um, both males of both species present. So this is not a choice experiment. The female Aedes uh, aegypti and the female Aedes albopictus are only allowed in these experiments to mate with an, a heterospecific male, and the you can see that the logistic regression shows that. Female origin, but male origin, uh, only female origin with significant male origin was not. And in further um, cage studies, we showed that one could select for the allopatric uh, phenotype to the sympatric phenotype very rapidly in cages in which aegypti females were exposed to Aedes albopictus males. So within a few generations, the population, which was 55% um, or more susceptible to interspecific mating, could, could be um, reduced to 15 or 10% or susceptible. And this is the same trend in the Miami uh, Egypti population, but a somewhat different uh, initial starting point. So I think um, we have established that satirization plays some role. And uh, there's been discussion among mosquito control directors in South Florida in the past five or so years that they're seeing more Aedes aegypti. And we, in fact, in, even in our cemeteries that we thought were what we called exclusion cemeteries. We were beginning to find Aedes aegypti, albeit at very low numbers in what is not their preferred habitat. So we do agree at this point that Aedes aegypti is showing signs of recovery in South Florida. And we're continuing to investigate the relationship of that apparent recovery phenomenon to evidence of satirization resistance in Aedes aegypti to interspecific mating with Aedes albopictus. And I wanted to um, add one component, one uh, really just uh, surveillance component to the equation that these two species do not occupy exactly the same ecological niche in either the adult or the, the larval stages. This represents um, principal components of based on char habitat characterization from aerial imagery of collections of these species made with overposition traps. And the heavy loading for Aedes albopictus occurs on axes which ha uh, have a, a high representation of native habitat earth and vegetation, and um, represented also with uh, this canopy. A and C stands for um, asphalt and concrete. The uh, Aedes aegypti has heavier loading for highly urbanized habitats without um, any vegetation. Another study that is still ongoing in collaboration with uh, my former postdoc, Michael Reiskin, who is now an assistant professor at North Carolina State, were following uh, transects 
from the coast inland, which also represents a precipitation gradient. Uh, in this part of Florida, the coasts are drier and it becomes wetter inland. And you can see that um, by the color intensity that Aedes aegypti uh, preferentially was uh, recovered from coastal areas compared to inland areas. And that particular surveillance was done in 2006 and 7, and we compared that with um, results from the same transects um, surveyed last year with an, an apparent increase in the intensity uh, of the relative abundance of Aedes aegypti from the coast inland, which would seem to corroborate the trends that we were finding in the exclusion cemeteries of a re recrudescence of Aedes aegypti. And this um, graph simply compares um, with a simple t-test the relative abundance of the two species between those sampling periods. And you can see uh, at the intermediate distance, uh, the proportion of Aedes aegypti in 2013 was significantly greater than it um, than in 2006 and 7. Now, based on um, our lab studies, we also asked the question, uh, is SATA resistance costly? And the few measures that we had would indicate that it, that it is. So the first bars and these three panels represent um, an index of body size, an index of fecundity, and an index of mating behavior compares the allopatric condition with uh, a line that's been selected for six or seven generations for satirization resistance. The resistant line is smaller, uh, produces fewer eggs, and this was, this behavioral index is an indication of uh, what proportion of uh, females would mate with conspecifics over a 15 uh, or I think a half hour interval. And you can see that uh, the mating behavior has changed to, in, to the extent that they are more reluctant to mate with conspecifics. That is to say, they, the, these satirization resistant females are just more choosy and would be, as would be appropriate to avoid a mistake. Another index of the probable cost of, of satirization resistance can be observed in these uh, further cage studies showing what happens after one has reached the six generations of exposure to albopictus and then release the, the selection by removing Aedes albopictus and simply letting different lines drift. You can see there is a rapid return to becoming more susceptible uh, in, in these lines to interspecific mating, which is a, another indication of the apparent cost of um, this evolution. Finally, um, just to conclude this um, section of the presentation, this little graphic shows what, how I feel or my lab in general feels are the important factors in explaining uh, how Aedes albopictus um, reduced uh, populations of Aedes aegypti upon its arrival. And the, if you, the notations are confusing. The blue represents albopictus, the uh, red Aedes aegypti. We believe that satirization really can be uh, the only explanation for these rapid uh, reductions and eliminations in some cases of Aedes uh, Egypti from situations along the Gulf Coast, that larval competition certainly is a factor in um, explaining the distrib ultimate uh, distribution and superior comp competitive ability of Aedes albopictus, particularly in rural and vegetated areas, but the different niche um, favoritism of the two species also explains uh, how they become segregated uh, across an urban to, to rural gradient. 
And certainly, although we are uh, doing um, experiments in different parts of uh, the tropics as well, latitude comes into play. And at um, different latitudes, there's certainly a, um, an effect of the higher adaptability a uh, better adaptability of Aedes aegypti to more tropical conditions and the superior uh, adaptability of Aedes albopictus to more temperate conditions. OK, I said I would um, wind up the final 10 or 15 minutes by discussing um, competition in the context of dengue transmission. The simplest model of, of dengue transmission in its epidemic form in urban environments is a simple um, infected host transmission to uninfected female. After passing extrinsic incubation, the virus is ready to be um, passed on through biting to uh, an uninfected host. Uh, there is, certainly, this is potentially a, a simplification. There are maybe other factors uh, involved in maintenance of dengue in epidemic environments. But what we tested in the field was based on um, the PhD results of my former student, Barry Alto, who was a postdoc here, in fact, funded uh, in Paul Turner's lab, um, funded by a YCEI postdoc. And for his doctorate, he investigated effects of larval competition in the lab between these two species and, and included interspecific competition, uh, allowing females that emerged from uh, competitive conditions to feed on dengue-infected blood meals, and then after extrinsic incubation period, uh, tested for virus uh, infection and dissemination, dissemination being, uh, in our case, a surrogate for a capacity to transmit uh, in the context of their larval environment. And what Barry found was that um, more intense competition, represented here by the green and, and, and red circles, led to uh, a higher infection and dissemination rate in Aedes albopictus. The same trend occurred in Aedes aegypti, but was not uh, statistically significant. And in a further analysis of those data, Barry was able to segregate based on body size and, and, um, and dengue infection status, um, both Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti uh, infected and, and disseminated infections occurred um, or more likely in smaller uh, females in both species. So these, although uh, in the former experiment, the trends for Aedes aegypti were not significant in this analysis they were. So um, my colleague Steve Giuliano and I um, posed the question to our collaborators at the Oswaldo Cruz Institute, can we detect or look for a signal of effect of a in higher infection probability in the field uh, in a dengue en endemic environment? Uh, this is uh, Guanabara Bay uh, from the mountains, uh, such as Cristo do Redentor in the background. And this shows the seasonal pattern of dengue transmission in Rio de Janeiro. So anyone going to the uh, World Cup will be glad to know they're not in the peak uh, dengue period. But we were fortunate enough to have chosen to collect our mosquitoes during a, quite an epidemic in 2008. Um, these studies uh, have been waiting to be published, but they haven't been. Our, this represents our collection area in what's called Manguinhos, uh, a neighborhood that actually includes the Oswaldo Cruz Institute. And collections were done with power aspirators from uh, domestic habitats uh, expected to have um, some dengue infected females. We collected from over 20 neighborhoods in Manguinos, 
And those with these uh, red stars, we found dengue infected individuals. And from those collections with uh, dengue infected individuals, we measured the wing length as an indication, an index of body size, and individually processed uh, every collected female for dengue infection, positive or negative. We were able to find 55 dengue infected females, which was enough for us to do a uh, regression analysis. And this logistic regression did not support uh, Barry Alto's PhD results in the sense that this, see that the y-axis represents probability of being uninfected and the larger uh, females in this regression analysis are, have a higher probability of being infected. Uh, I've included date here in the, even though it doesn't show a statistically significant p-value because it, um, the AIC value uh, was significantly uh, better, including date in the final model. And this 3D representation uh, shows the effect of wing length on the probability of being infected uh, and uses also date of collection to, uh, to add to that model. So, I'm going to wind up uh, intentionally, hoping to uh, leave time for, for comments. I'm not really see there's any point in um, reading the summary, which you can do if you want. The main uh, thrust of the reproductive interference uh, results are that uh, interspecific um, mating is certainly believed uh, by us to be a, an important component of understanding how competitive displacement has occurred between these species. And uh, just parenthetically, we're now uh, processing and applying PCR diagnostics to specimens from tropical countries. We've already done samples from Venezuela, Gabon, and we're finding interspecific mating occurring wherever these two species uh, meet in, in nature. So I, although we don't have the the type of long-term surveillance from many of these countries and are, aren't able to necessarily show that competitive displacement has occurred. In all probability, we believe that this phenomenon is occurring uh, across the globe. So uh, with that, I'll close and ask for comments or questions. Thank you. <laughs>